Before I begin, I'm standing up here looking at Gordon Pennington's bio, and it's very impressive. We are going to learn a lot tonight. What I ask and I challenge you is give him your undivided attention. What I'm asking is that if you're slouching right now and you're feeling tired, I want you sitting up. I want your elbows off your knees, I want your head out of your hands, and I want you paying attention. And I appreciate all the directors do because we are going to learn a lot tonight. So if you haven't done that already, right now I ask, please, adjust your posture and get ready to listen, get ready to learn because these are the nuggets we want to hear. Gordon Pennington is the founder of Burning Man or Burning Media Group and serves as its managing director. Mr. Pennington began his career at Wall Street developing marketing and communications for institutional investors in the emerging electronic banking services sector of Citicorp, and serving as a consultant to both Chase Manhattan Bank and J.P. Morgan Bank. He then turned to the fast growth consumer product markets, serving as director of marketing for Tommy Hilfiger, where he held position as the fastest growing menswear company in the world. Working with the United States Council on Economic Development, Mr. Pennington led the team to assist American CEOs in assessing emerging Soviet investment opportunities at the end of the communist era. He has also managed marketing and strategy assi assi sorry, assignments and been advisor to Apple Computer, British Airways, the CBS Television Network, the Coca-Cola Company, Equinox Fitness, Rollerblade, the Oxford Analytica, Miato Investment Banking of London, the Ministry of Defense in the UK, in the Jonathan Edwards Center at Yale, where he is also a board member. He serves as a member of advisory board of Saber 7 Inc. Mr. Pennington is a trustee of the Universal Literacy Program Project and has gained a rich understanding of the significance of literacy as a fundamental civil right with particular interest in the international educational setting. He has appeared on television and lectures in the United States and abroad where he has been a speaker on media culture and communications and other related subjects at Columbia University, Michigan State University, the University of Virginia, um, McGill University, McMaster University, New York University, Yale, Princeton, Oxford, and Cambridge University. He has also provided briefings on culture to the White House, members of Congress and the Senate of the United States of America, and members of the British Parliament. Mr. Pennington is a founding board member and vice president, vice president of charitable organizations, global advisor to the international arts movement, and a member of the board of the Jose Limon Dance Company. Please join me in welcoming, welcoming the Team Focus Way, Mr. Pennington. Thank you, Mark. That's a mouthful. And uh, not all of it's up to date. I'm going to put some slides up there in a moment. You, there's no rush. What I'd like to do in the time we have together here, I think we've got about 45 minutes, and then I'd like to save some time for questions and answers and interact with you guys. First of all, thank you for inviting me, Coach. What a great uh, movement this is. It needs to be spread to more and more cities, not just eight cities across the United States today, but we really want to see that vision spread. You're changing lives. What I want to talk about tonight is the journey of life. We're all on a journey, and we're on a journey that we can share together, that we can walk through separately. But how do we make that journey together? What is the journey of life? Where are we? How do we find a map? It's accurate. How do we find a compass or a GPS system that allow us to know where we are in that journey? Those are questions I have found everyone in this world is asking. Whatever advantages people have in terms of family, privilege, resources, money, education, mobility, or whatever disadvantages people may think they have, the decisions you make about who you are where you are and where you're going are all up to you. I've met enough people in this world who've had every advantage and have thrown it away. And I've met people who've had very few advantages who've made fantastic choices 
tough choices, but made the most of their lives. The difference is the narrative or story or messaging that goes on in our hearts and minds. So what's the narrative that's going on in your head at this point in your life? What kind of messaging are you allowing into your thought life? Is it true or is it false? And I have a little bit of experience here because I've spent over 20 years of my life in marketing communications, branding, advertising, and creating messages. Creating messages that in some cases allowed me to spend millions of dollars to reinforce very simple messages. Messages so simple you'd laugh. Messages so simple it'd say, if you wear a certain kind of clothing, I'll create an image around that that will make you feel as though your life is better. And this is what we did on 7th Avenue in New York City. 7th Avenue is the garment district. 7th Avenue is where Jewish tailors once labored away in third floor lofts and now headquarters to many of the leading fashion brands. 7th Avenue, is, as the garment district, is where we used to joke, even as we were spending millions of dollars hiring photographers for $25,000 a day and more, and models and set designers and lighting experts, to create what? Create an image. It was a true image or a false image. Beautiful images, desirable images, aspirational images. But is it true that just by buying a suit of clothes or a certain kind of brand, that your life really will be better? You might feel better. And feeling better might improve your thoughts about yourself. Improving your thoughts about yourself might in fact make you feel like you can do things you couldn't do before you bought a certain kind of clothing. Now that seems pretty silly and superficial on a certain level, doesn't it? But on the other hand, as a man thinketh, so is he. So what do you think about yourself? What do you think others think about you? What do you want others to think about you? And how much time do we spend thinking about these things? Because the narrative, or the story, or the set of ideas that people reinforce or plant in your mind represent one of the biggest challenges, one of the biggest struggles that any of us have on the journey of life. So the question is, what are the stories that are in your head that you tell yourself that others say, tell you about you, or that you tell others about you? What's your story? It all comes down to how we live with a true identity. Paul writes to a skeptical audience talking about the Apostle Paul in the first century, maybe one of the greatest minds in the first century, the Hellenistic world, where the Romans were emulating what they felt classical Greek culture could teach them. But here's this quaint little culture that they had occupied, the Hebrew culture, where they say they have prophets. They say they have prophets. And one of their prophets is, in fact, the Anointed One, the Mashiach, the Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth. And his emissary, the most vocal, the most articulate, the most gifted emissary in the first century for this movement becomes one who wanted to kill people who followed this Messiah, the Apostle Paul. So as he prepares to go to Rome and writes to the skeptical, most educated, most sophisticated, most informed audience in the Hellenistic world, the Romans, he makes this statement. Do not, these people consider themselves very, very sophisticated. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is good, acceptable, and perfect. So tonight, I'd like to talk about the good, the acceptable, and the perfect, because the three Greek words that Paul uses there have very distinct meaning. Paul could have just said, hey, so you can do the right thing. Transform your mind so you do the right thing. Why does Paul use three very specific and powerful words? Good, acceptable, and perfect. Park that thought. Park the thought about an identity, journey, having a map, having a compass, knowing where you are on life's journey with a kind of spiritual GPS. 
park that thought for a moment because uh, I want to tell you first of all how moved I've been by the conversations I've had with some of you. I've really appreciated your vulnerability in telling your stories and sharing what you're doing. I've really been grateful for the way you've been open with me and uh, my colleague Nicholas. And being here is a great privilege because we've known Coach for years. And Mickey, thank you for again for having us because I, I think I didn't fully appreciate just how wonderful this movement is. This isn't just a program. What you've got here is a movement. Would you agree with that, gentlemen? There's a lot here to explore. And I, like uh, most of you, uh, I grew up fatherless. I'm the only child of an only child of an only child, and I have an only child. And uh, I grew up and, and now live back in the house that was built by my great-grandparents 104 years ago. And my parents divorced when I was two. And uh, my dad just turned 90 two weeks ago. And I just learned two weeks ago for the first time in my life that I was unwanted, that I came along as a surprise, and that my dad had wanted to arrange for an abortion, which was hard to get at that time. But other influences prevailed, and I get to be here with you guys. So, praise God. But my father and mother divorced by the time I was two, and my dad inherited money and moved to Europe. He was in Italy and Switzerland, and I never saw him. He surprised my mother one day, though. He came back and visited me for one afternoon when I was four. My mother dressed me up so I looked nice. And I remember this, this strange, unfamiliar man coming to visit me for an afternoon, and then he disappeared, and I never saw him again until I was 18. So I was familiar with that idea, growing up, wanting to play baseball in the Little Leagues or basketball. My mother had to, like many of your mothers, had to carry on a lot of responsibility. She was a school teacher. When my parents were, she went back to graduate school, and we lived in a one-room apartment in student housing. We really didn't have much furniture. We didn't have much of anything. We lived in Ann Arbor, Michigan, where she was going to the University of Michigan. So I was fortunate that way. I was around educated people. But I don't remember a lot of kids my age. I was put in a university education, school of education, the Horace Rackham Graduate School in Ann Arbor, and they were trying new curricula on the kids. So I guess I was part of an experiment. But I don't remember playing with a lot of kids my age at that time, except when we'd go to the university and be around these kids. So those are some of my early memories. I'm grateful that I wasn't exposed to some of the challenges that many of us go through, violence or abandonment, or, well, maybe abandonment, but it's funny, growing up with my mother and my grandmother, I can tell you one thing I'm grateful for to this day. I never heard them raise their voices and shout in an argument in my whole life. And what a blessing. And when I get mad, sometimes I catch myself raising my voice and I say, you know what? That's not like me. That's not what I heard growing up. And I, and I think it's tempered me. I'm grateful. I'm grateful for that. But not having a father, I remember going to play baseball and kids would come up to me. I was the only kid in my town, in Owasso, Michigan, where I grew up, that I knew from a divorced family. Can you imagine that in the early 1960s? I was the only kid in my town that I knew from a divorced family. And I felt kind of embarrassed or ashamed. I didn't know what to think. I didn't figure it was my fault, but those are the circumstances. And when I'd go to play baseball, kids would come up to me and say, don't you have a father? I say, well, I mean, everybody's got a father. I got here somehow. He says, where's your father? Is your father alive? And I said, well, yeah. Well, where's your father? I said, I don't know. A lot of you can relate to that. I wanted to know my father. I wish my father had been there for me at baseball games and lots of other things. My mother didn't know anything about baseball. She couldn't catch. So I'd go to a wall at a playground nearby, I took a tennis ball, and became a pitcher just by throwing hundreds of times, no, thousands of times, over and over again. And I became a pretty good starting pitcher. But I remember how angry I would get when other kids would come up to me, well, all that father's a pitcher with them, do things with them, and just 
say, where's your father? And I just didn't have an answer. So I had a hard time later in life, and I'll tell you a little of my testimony about my personal journey. I had a hard time thinking of God as my father. That took a real breakthrough. So maybe you can relate to that. But my mother did become a basketball coach. In the course of becoming a basketball, she was a terrible basketball coach, by the way. But she was enthusiastic. I will say when it came to uh, skills and drills, we were probably the worst team in the league. But when it came to running, we were fantastic. Because all my mother knew how to do was get us to run up and down and up and down and up and down. And that was so she was really good. She got a whistle, by the way. You give a woman a whistle and put her on a basketball court, stand back. <laughs> but we were fast. We just didn't know where we were going or what we were doing. <laughs> so, <laughs> I think back about it now and I can have a sense of humor about it, but it was painful. It was hard. So in the course of my life, by the time I was a teenager, I was angry. I was angry at God, I was angry at life. I didn't know why. My mother hadn't done anything wrong, really. I couldn't blame her, my grandmother. But there was just me, my mother, my grandmother, and my great-grandfather. When he was alive till I was about five years old. That was my family. One each of four generations. That's a different kind of household, you know. And we were taking care of my great-grandfather. He was getting old. My grandmother was there. My mother was there. That's all I knew about family. I didn't understand big families. And uh, I thought my family was strange. But that's all I understood. So I was grateful for that. But I'd have moments of rage where I would, I don't know what came over me. I think it was a spirit of some kind. But I would become so angry, I would just rip my shirts open, rip all the buttons off my shirt. I just felt this sense of loneliness. Hey, there's nobody to play with. There are no kids to share things with. I just went through life that way. So that's all I knew. By the time I was in my teens, I was experimenting with drugs. I was getting around the wrong kids. I'd gone to church every Sunday. I'd heard about God and Jesus in, in the Episcopal tradition. But I didn't understand a lot of it was in Elizabethan English. You know the King James Bible? And they have the first lesson, the second lesson, and I didn't understand it. But I knew that I respected God. I just didn't feel like I knew God. And so I look up at the stained glass window and I think, maybe God's shining a light through that prism somehow and it's supposed to get to me, but I just didn't feel like I had a personal relationship with God. I wanted to, but I didn't. And so I wanted to live in an altered state because I, I reckon that most people get to a certain point where the pain in life is so great that they just want to live in an altered state. So I did. And whatever came my way, I would try it. Try every kind of drug except I didn't want to stick a needle in my arm. By the time I got to college, I was pretty proficient at uh, what I call partying now. It was just living in an altered state to manage my pain. But with some people, it make you popular. With other people, they want to stay away from you. So I had to figure out where I wanted to be. And I was walking across the campus of the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor one day, and a guy came up to me and said, have you heard the good news? And I thought he was going to take me to a hash bash. It was Ann Arbor then in the 70s. And uh, some of you don't even know what hash is, I guess, and I'm glad you don't. It's not corned beef hash, but <laughs> it's just another way to live in an altered state, right? Pain gets too great, temptation is to live in an altered state. This, I said, what's the good news? And this guy sat me down and he said, Jesus is coming again. That's all he said. And I thought that was the strangest thing I'd ever heard anybody say on a street corner. Jesus is coming again. Well, what, what do you do with that information? And I sat down with that man, and he led me through the four spiritual laws. You know the four spiritual laws? Basically, God loves you, has a wonderful plan for your life. You have to take that by faith. I did. But I did. And I believed it. He said, we're separated from God and His love because of what? What? Sin. sin. What's sin? Doing the wrong thing. Why do we do the wrong thing? What is it in us that we do the wrong thing? Our flesh. What's the flesh? Our human nature. In the back. Say again. Temptation is part of it. Thank you. Free will. 
great answers. Sir? Thinking you're, you're doing what other people think is this. Say it again, please. Can you stand up? Thinking what you're thinking what you are doing is what somebody will think that is the best. Right. But it's not the best, right? It's just what you think is the best. What's your name? Riley. Thank you. When you stand when you answer, stand up and tell me your name. Sir. Oh, maybe not, not thinking it through. Great. Being of the world, perfect. Well, all that, every single answer is a facet of what sin is. And I figure that sin is basically, it's that part of us that is estranged from fellowship with our Creator. And everything that comes out of that, none of that can be good. Because we were made to be in relationship. So when he told me this, a light bulb went off on me in my head in that street corner in Ann Arbor that day. And he said, God has done something about this distance between us, this estrangement of sin. He's entered this world at great risk, you know, under an assumed identity as a human being, as a son of a carpenter. Mm -hmm. In Nazareth, can any good thing come from Nazareth, as the Jews said at that time? No. <laughs> <laughs> That's what they thought. But the greatest thing of all came from an unexpected place. Can any good thing come from the hood? Yeah. God's in it. Yeah. It's a man with self-confidence. So that was my picture. That's where I was at that day. And that day, he said, I said, what, what's remaining to do? You have to exercise your own free will and ask Christ, invite him to come into your life. And I did that. And that was the beginning of the things that changed my whole life. Well, I still had a lot to learn. I was still in college. I met a gal who had a similar experience. She had a life where she was emotionally estranged from her father. And she had come back to the United States after having her third abortion with the third boyfriend in a row, she was in her early 20s, and she had come back, she was devastated. And a voice somehow told her she had the ability to get on a plane and go to Israel. She went to Jerusalem, and there she encountered a Franciscan monk who saw her in her pain and sorrow and led her to faith. This is all going on at the same time. I haven't met her yet. She came back to her family's summer home in Michigan, and we became friends. And a couple years later, we got married in our 20s. I was 22 years old. And we were married for seven years, had a child. In the midst of that, the relationship was spiraling downward because we still hadn't worked out our relationships with our fathers. There were still issues in our lives that had this up, mostly on my part. I didn't know how to be a giving, loving, self-sacrificing servant and put somebody else's needs ahead of my own. I hadn't seen that model. And I really didn't know how to do it. And when that relationship fell apart, I didn't want it to end in divorce, but it did. When it did, I went into a deep spiral of self-pity. A different narrative started in my head. And the narrative went like this. You're not useful to God because you failed in this essential, primary, fundamentally important relationship, marriage. And I didn't know how to get the help or counseling. Is Mark, uh, is Mark still here? Who was playing the piano earlier? Yes, sir. Mark, I love that song you played. You know, we all need a friend, someone we can lean on. You just might have a problem that I'd understand. Yeah, yes, I love that song. And I need somebody who understood my problem, Mark, at that time. So I went into a downward spiral. But then another narrative started in my head. Another, another competing sense of identity. I thought, if I, if I was seen as important by the world, or if I went out and made a lot of money, people would respect me. And I went out and I got very fortunate. I was just fortunate, really. I was at the right place at the right time. And you've been trained in this, gentlemen. You've been taught how to present yourself, even posture, as, as you said, Mark, earlier. How you sit, how you address people. What, what has impressed me and has impressed other people here 
is the way you come up and present yourself. You present yourself with dignity, with, with self-respect, and with an earnest interest in other people. I can't tell you how impressed I've been at how many of you gentlemen have come up to me, extended your hands, and said, how do you do? You might introduce yourself by name and look someone right in the eyes with a confidence and a sincerity and a genuine warmth and an interest. I have felt that over and over. I haven't had a chance to meet all of you, but I have felt that over and over again. I know Nicholas has. I know we've just felt so warmly received here and a connection to you. That will serve you well. And I must say that by the grace of God, I did have that sense of the importance of self-respect and a certain dignity, even though I didn't feel it. Even though I didn't feel it. I ended up with a couple of opportunities that one job leads to another. If you do something well, have you heard this expression, you was faithful in that which is least? You do something, it's a small responsibility well, it will lead to other opportunities. Gentlemen, ask the coaches, ask the mentors here, ask people in business, it will open doors for you. But I got those opportunities, and the next thing I know, I was making more money in a week than I'd ever made in a year. I was making more money than I, I personally ever dreamt was possible in a, in a salary position, with stock options and all kinds of interesting opportunities to grow. And I was around powerful business people, and I was in the fashion industry, and the next thing you know, I was going to dinners with very interesting people, and people that are at similar points in their career starting out. I met movie stars. I met rock stars, I met fashion stars. I, 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 I would be around them all the time. And, and I watched how people lived their lives. I watched what was important to them. I watched what they said and did behind closed doors and after hours. And I thought, what a fascinating, dazzling world to fly places on people's private jets, to go to the Mediterranean Sea and be on mega yachts and to, and to be at, at dinner parties in Hollywood or Rome or London, all over the world, had the opportunity to be with some of the wealthiest. In fact, I was a dinner guest of the wealthiest man in the world at that time. And he didn't recognize me. It was a black tie dinner in the south of France, and I showed up, and he thought I was a member of the orchestra that was playing. <laughs> so uh, I was sent to the wrong room to, to tune up with the orchestra. And uh, when he found out that I was actually an invited guest of one of his other guests, there's 25 people there, including the son of a, t a prominent politician in the U.S. and the brother of the king of Saudi Arabia, a very interesting group of people. And he was so embarrassed, it was like a, somehow the movie snapped his fingers and a butler appeared with a silver tray and a, and a glass of wine and a bottle of wine. It was, it was like out of a movie. But I've seen, I could go on and tell you experiences. I, I met Johnny Depp early in his career. Uh, I, I could just go on and on and on and name drop. I still have friends in Hollywood that are famous movie stars. Uh, multiple houses, hundreds of millions of dollars. I know people that have built billions of dollars. And they share this income. Nobody has a deeper sense of who they are than the person who knows who they are in Christ. And if you want to have the deepest sense of I, the most honest and powerful sense of identity. You have to know who you are in Christ. Because the more you have popularity, the more you have, the coaches will tell you this about athletes and, and, and television stars. There's so many people who can tell you stories the same way. I'm just saving you a lot of heartache and misery and, and misguided activity. You might know this already. But to know who you are in Christ and to be able to hear that still small voice and it have that the comfort and consolation that only God's Spirit can give you is the greatest gift this world can give you. Because people who have enormous wealth have people they can hire and fire, but they don't know who their friends are. Movie stars. Everybody wants to be around popular people, but do you know who your friends are? The friendships you're going to make here at Team Focus and at a camp like this are the relationships that are going to mean more to you as you cultivate and nurture and maintain them. And you have to invest in friendship. Friendship isn't something you can take for granted. You have to stay in touch with each other, reach out to each other. Not just when you have a need or someone else has a need. You have to anticipate need in real friendship. It really means calling up somebody and saying, how are you? And mean it. 
Just check in with each other. That's the greatest thing you can have. And those are the friendships that will be the most important to you later in life. Well, in the midst of making money and thinking I was a big deal, I also spiraled into misery. Because the narrative going on in my head, even though I had put up this front, was that I really had failed God. It didn't matter how much money I had or who I was around or how hard I worked at getting other people to think I was very happy and successful and, and secure in that. I wasn't. I was miserable. And I became, I felt prey to the enemy. I felt prey to drugs, alcohol, all kinds of stuff. And I it was probably the most miserable time in my life until finally, one day I had a supernatural visitation from God in my apartment on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. And I literally woke up. One, some days I'd wake up and I had blood alcohol poisoning. I'd be passing out. I mean, this is just this is just a horrible way to live. I couldn't get to, and I was failing in relationships. I was failing to follow through. I was failing to show up. I was failing. But God took me at that point of failure. And I literally woke up one day and saw the words, choose life. And I thought, I must be hung over, something's wrong with me. With my eyes wide open, as if you were staring at a bright light, and then close your eyes and you see a, the ghosted impression on your retina, the electrochemical impression there. And the, then you open your eyes again, you still see that outline. I saw the words, choose life. And I knew it was God. And I knew it was from Jeremiah. The book of Jeremiah, I fell to my knees, I cried out to God and said, God, I've been running from you all this time. Please take me. Please forgive me. Please heal me. Please show me how to. And from that day on, I, I got to my knees and I've been sober and clean from drugs and alcoholism ever since. that encouragement. But that's the beginning of the things that began to really change my life. And then God gave me a heart for missions and a heart for humanity and a heart, something sparked up again. That's how I met Coach. I wouldn't have met Coach or Rick Joyner or so many wonderful people I met until God got a hold of my life again and said, it never was about your deserving to be righteous before me. It was about what I've done for you. And I can't tell you how that has set me free. Realizing I'll never earn or deserve God's love. I want to do the right thing because Jesus did the right thing for me. He's righteous. We love because he first loved us. That's the change. So I spent a lot of my life on Wall Street and Madison Avenue, creating images, working with some of the best directors.